Welcome everybody to our webinar for today, all about your practitioner journey, how you can take the steps you need to become a practitioner yourself. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to share with you a lot of different things today, um, but all of these are going to apply whether you're going to become a practitioner of water cycle restoration or something else. This same general process can apply to all sorts of different professions that you might want to engage in. Uh, you know, this is really going to focus on the journey of becoming a water cycle restoration practitioner, but these same kind of lessons apply. And so one of the most important things here, I think, is to make your own path, to create your own path. Uh, and it should be unique to you, to your situation, to your context, to what your desires are and what your skills and abilities are. Uh, and so I'm going to share with you what worked for me, hoping that it'll be helpful in modeling the same, the same transition and growth for yourself. I think it's important to know, you know, 10 years ago, I was a nobody in this field. I had no reputation, no skills, no abilities. I had a little bit more than 10 years ago now, but I keep saying to 10 years. Um, but it's you know, in really just a relatively short period of time, I've now become one of the leading voices in this field and where I actually have all sorts of people contacting me for projects on their land when, you know, if you look at the beginning of this journey I'm going to share with you today, I was a kid fresh out of university with no real world applicable skills or experience in this field. So the process of becoming a practitioner, I think, it's something I've thought about a lot. What was my journey like? And for me, it breaks out into these four different phases of growth. Discovery, experience, advocate, and practice. And I'm going to dive into each of these today. And it's important to note, too, that these aren't. this isn't a unique, clear line, but these are actually overlapping phases of growth. That discovery phase continues all the way throughout. The experience phase continues all the way throughout. So there are the different phases, and you're going to have more or less of these at different periods of time, but it's something that should be ever-present with you through this. And so the first part of that is discovery, really finding out you know, what is in the world, what speaks to you. And for me, a lot of the discovery that led me towards this path was in ecological systems understanding how the behavior of wolves changed the ecosystem in Yellowstone and how really this web of life has all these intricacies and efficiencies that aren't immediately clear, but are part of what we rely upon. And so I was really lucky to be able to discover a lot of different places. Uh, but one of the really important discoveries was actually not the person on the left here, Sepp Holtz are very important that we'll get to, but the person on the right here, John Hemmighaus. And he's a recluse gardener, fourth generation plantsman who made this beautiful ecosystem greenhouse. And you know, it was through this process of discovery that I developed this connection, trying to see what was out there. I was interested in greenhouses, living in Montana and wanting to grow food. And eventually I literally just looked this guy up in the phone book from a, a name that someone had given me, called him up, and he ended up becoming one of my most important plant mentors and teaching me all sorts of things that really enabled me to then be able to take the next step when I met that next mentor. And so this is a beautiful ecosystem greenhouse is this concept of perpetual soils. And he's never put any inputs into this greenhouse, not even outside composting. It recycles its own fertility. It has natural pest management with beneficials controlling all the predatory insects. And so it's a really beautiful example of what humans can develop in harmony with nature. Uh, and, you know, I can almost guarantee you that there is some example like this in your area. There is somebody who has spent their life learning from nature that you can learn a lot from. And a lot of times these people are going to, you know, not be on the front page of the newspaper. They're going to be the more reclusive types. And so you really have to seek them out in this discovery phase. Uh, and you know, it, I can't tell you how much fun it was to be part of this, where I kept going out there for years, helping him in the greenhouse, learning about how he was doing everything. And I always say I was born in Georgia, but the best peach I've ever had was in Montana, grown in Montana, because just the level of 
life and vitality in the system rang through to the fruit. And, you know, you're eating a pear that you're drinking the pear more than eating it because juice is just going everywhere. And it's just this amazing experience. And so I ended up developing a business, building these. Uh, this greenhouse in particular, it, it's really nice in that it never freezes using passive solar and geothermal, but it also, because of this passive geothermal, drawing earth temperature air into the greenhouse, it can actually be cooler in here than it is outside in the dead of summer. But I share this to mostly to illustrate that it's important in this discovery phase to remain flexible, to not get narrowed in, because I could have just kept working on greenhouses forever and never discovered this whole other world that really spoke to me much more loudly and clearly. And so even though I was well on this path with building ecosystem greenhouses, when I discovered Sepp Holzer, this just blew the lid off of everything. Here was something that applied to all humans on the planet, not just the wealthier people who can afford all of these materials and investments that are required to build a greenhouse. And so, you know, just by chance, I came to this 11 day workshop where we created this landscape in just 11 days. And this just lit a fire in me for something that here was someone doing everything I had dreamed of as a kid. And this was when, you know, I was pretty young and ready to absorb all of this, but this discovery can happen at any point in your life. And so then getting really grabbed, I then visited his places in Austria and kept learning from him and seeing the incredible things that they do. You know, here's just one example where they're producing so many different crops every year and then they harvest what does the best. So rather than fighting nature in a really wet year, the cherries are splitting and they don't even worry about harvesting them because the mushrooms are going gangbusters. And likewise, in a dry year, it's the opposite. And so you discover all these different tricks and tools of the trade and way of doing things. Uh, and really way of working with nature and working with other people as well. And then seeing his new place, where it's in a much drier part of Austria, uh, where land was sold because it thought was thought to be unproductive. And he's created this beautiful system there with food falling on the ground year round. And the first time I went there, you know, it was after 10 years of no management, and yet food was falling on the ground all over the place. Uh, and you see just the results of cultivating and stewarding genetics. You know, look at this sunflower on the right just blowing out of the screen. And he has grains that produce crazy amounts. Here's an apple tree falling over with its own fruit, loaded with grapes, and all grown with no inputs just by partnering with nature. Then seeing and experiencing, you know, these results of transforming deserts into paradise in Portugal and then in Spain as well. And seeing how it's not just the water in the water body, but around the water body that really creates this impact. And so it's been a really incredible to get to have this discovery period and just a huge amount of admiration and gratitude for Sepp Holzer, who's really, you know, allowed me to stand on his shoulders in a way. And so in that discovery phase, you want to figure out what is valuable to you? Where do you want to spend your time? What are the kinds of things that you want to be doing? And you want to taste the whole rainbow. You want to keep learning about different things and experiencing different ways of going about the world. And then you move into this second phase, which is experience, where I like to say you want to get your head in underwater, but you don't want to drown yourself. And so you want to keep putting yourself in situations where you have to grow, where you have to build skills in your hand, where you have a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And it can help if this is with some guidance and mentorship. Uh, and certainly it really helped kickstart me to get to do some of this with SEP. But the most important projects are the ones that you do yourself, where you have to make all the judgment calls and you have to have all the repercussions. Uh, and so, you know, I kept doing these different projects, creating crater gardens and immediately seeing the amount of humidity and life that was created just by creating this structuring, whereby keeping out a lot of the wind in this dry, desiccated area, here was a really humid, productive microclimate, even in an otherwise desertifying landscape. 
creating natural ponds, swimming pools, all sorts of different features, terrace gardens and hugo cultures, where, you know, people that are having their first garden are blown away by how easy it is to garden this way. And why doesn't everyone garden this way? And because they don't have this idea of clean rows of different things. And, you know, those kind of experiences really give you energy and give you the positive momentum to continue. You're also going to do stupid things like this, <laughs> you know, getting in over your head in an open trench is not a good idea. Uh, definitely don't recommend this to anyone. Don't show this to my insurance company. Uh, but you have to get yourself in there to experience these things. You have to get yourself in over your head, not that way that I just showed, but, you know, metaphorically and do projects that are a little bit out of your comfort range. You know, take a big project in Ecuador when you haven't done a project internationally at all yet. And it ends up being every one of these steps a really important growing situation where you're learning so much about yourself and how to move through the world to create these things. And then it's really nice to, with whatever mentors you've established in that discovery phase, continue to get feedback from them. Continue, And so it was really amazing to always get to go visit Sep, show him my projects. And, you know, like a quest master in a video game, he'd tell me the next things I had to go get. So, you know, well, you've done a water body now, but have you built an earth cellar? Hey, go to Joseph, learn how to do that, build your own. Have you built an earth stable? Figure out how to do that. And have you tapped a spring? And so you have to do each of these things with your own hands because then each of those experiences leads to better being able to read and see the landscape. So having tapped that spring in Ecuador, I was able to see an area where I thought there was a spring underground, was pretty confident, and eventually found the piping that it was actually draining this away on the landscape. So that experience of tapping the spring enabled me to see what this landscape could be, even though it was something entirely different at the time I first visited. And so you're going to end up doing all these different types of projects, all these different things and skills that you have to accrue along this journey of becoming a practitioner. And so that experience phase, it goes on forever. You just build more and more experience and gain more value as you do so. And a lot of the experiences you'll gain don't directly relate to what you're doing. You know, here's a project in Uruguay where the biggest challenge here was figuring out that the first machine that they had bought wasn't going to work for the project. And we had to get another machine in and then that machine <laughs> broke. And so along these lines of these experiences, it's, you know, it's not all happy. It's not all fun, but it's all important to being able to navigate these types of situations the next time about. And so, you know, after all these experiences, by the time I was frustrated and had given up, SEP gave me certification. And this really made me value this certification because it wasn't just a participation trophy. This meant I had actually done all of the things. I could do the things on this kind of a level. Uh, and so that's a big reason why we've modeled our certification similarly. Phase three is all about becoming an advocate and really becoming a point of knowledge in your community. And this is really important no matter what type of way you want to be working, whether you want to work as a professional or just on your own landscape or just help others understand what's possible. It's really important to be able to talk about these things clearly and share them with others. If you just want to go into your own place and build a stable landscape, if the people around you don't understand it, you're going to have all this friction and trouble and fines and all sorts of issues that come. So even the most reclusive of us need to have some advocacy skills for us to be able to bring these things to others. Uh, and I liken this to bringing people into the forest, guiding people towards nature, showing people what's possible. And so once you start building some experience, you can really start sharing with others. One of the biggest things I think Sep does uh, is he enchants people with his vision of paradise. 
And so in this advocacy, it's really important to show people what's possible. Like we had a great webinar yesterday showing how, you know, even some of the most dire situations have plenty of potential to reverse and to improve if we start moving in the right direction. You can make these simple analogies, like the underground water being like a bank account. And if you're always drawing out and never putting back in, we know what happens. You can show people how a landscape receives rain in the natural state and in the man-made state, how this creates cycles of flood, drought, and fire. And you can see for yourself firsthand in visiting these places, you know, how pervasive and intensive this disturbance is. And then you can also look at it historically from all of these different places, but Plato, you know, more than 2000 years ago, talking about land degradation and its impacts on water and its impacts on climate. And you can find this again and again over time throughout history. And then there's just these really clear things that you can help people understand how we're creating these cycles of flood, drought, and fire, how we've lost 87% of Earth's wetlands and they won't come back on their own. And so it's really important that, especially as people experience these horrific outcomes of bad watershed management, that we also really advocate for what good watershed management looks like. And a lot of times this means putting yourself out there, making yourself uncomfortable, giving presentations and talks and seminars. Again, this is one of the things that for certain certifications, we require you to do for the course, not to outreach, but to outreach yourself in that community. Because for people to want to do it and move towards it, they need to know what's possible. Uh, and I share these because, you know, it doesn't need to have amazing results yet. This is a brand new project. It looks like a mud hole. But even so, when you give people the opportunity to learn, they'll come and seek that information. And so by putting yourself out there, giving presentations, giving workshops, advocating for, you know, our fellow humans and non-human beings, you really start to share this message and spread it. And each one of these becomes touch points where these people go on and share the message with their friends and their family. And slowly by slowly, you really start to have a lot of people interested in this kind of effort. I And... This is a big thing that I saw in all of these workshops with SEP is, you know, everyone who was at these different workshops, they all went on to do great things. They were all different, but they were all impacted by what they learned in these experiences. And so in this advocacy, sharing this message with others, there's a lot of power. And then we can see it on the really big scale, obviously, with Rajendra Singh's work in India, where you can just see the before and after of community-led movements, how it can recharge groundwater, create peace, revive rivers, all of these amazing things that are possible only through communities acting together. So that's why this advocacy part is really important. And then the fourth phase is practice, where you're really now skilled up. You can do all of the things. You have this wealth of experience to draw upon, and you're really ready to start doing it at a much bigger scale where, you know, now you're ready to create your own profession, create big projects that can make a big impact. Uh, you know, in this case, we've increased the spring flow in this valley 10 to 20 times in the summer from this decentralized water retention work we've done. And taking a farm that was, you know, very water scarce in a hillside that was very water scarce and made it water abundant. And so in this practice phase is where you're really now developing model projects and examples for others to be able to build and lean upon, where you're developing examples where farmers can survive a long drought, where people are rebalancing their impact on water, and where you're creating a lot of beautiful things that people are drawn to as well. Uh, one of the big things that happens is you build a project in one area, and then the neighbors see it, and all of a sudden you have to keep coming back to these areas to work again and again. And you can build these really amazing connections with the people that you're working for because you're really skilled. You can come in, you can do the work really efficiently. And there's this feedback loop of success that happens when you get in this flow where the more successful projects you create, it leads to more and more projects. Uh, and this is one of my favorite quotes. I almost always share it. Knowing is not enough. We must apply 
willing is not enough, we must do. And this is one of the big things for projects that achieve outcomes is that people just start doing things. People just start gaining experience. And that was one of the big things that led to my success as a practitioner, that I had this quest master constantly asking me to do different actions and achieve different outcomes. And it wasn't until a long period of time showing him my project, showing him the work that I was doing, that Sepp really told me to, okay, now you're doing a good job. You need to go out and create hundreds or thousands of people like you. Millions would be even better. Uh, and so this was really where this Water Stories core course was born. I feel very strongly that Sepp gave me this energy to transmit or inform people of this message of a better common future. And this course is really all designed around bringing you through that journey to share that same power and that same message. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Nick here, who is one of our founding members in the first Water Stories course, uh, and then got so busy doing the work that he didn't finish his certification till just uh, a couple of months ago, um, but is now one of our certified professionals as well and doing really amazing work uh, throughout Europe and other parts of the world as well. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for the, for the introduction. And yeah, for me, it was actually the, the starting point is a bit similar for me. Everything started when I was actually sitting on the toilet at a friend's place and they had a book um, from Zepp Holzer. It was there and it was also 10 years ago. And I read and I was like, wow, this stuff makes so much sense. Why isn't everyone doing this uh, this stuff of, of regenerating the planet? And that kind of sent me down into a very deep rabbit hole. And originally it was more on the side of kind of permaculture. So was just practicing lots of stuff, reading all the books, doing tons of PDCs, all this kind of stuff. Um, but I always kind of felt like, okay, something something was missing to get, to get active. Um, and then during the pandemic with a few friends, we started building a company called Climate Farmers here in Europe. So we support... Now, hundreds of farmers on their transition to regenerative agriculture. So they're working kind of on systemic change. But also through that kind of work, I realized many of the farmers, specifically here in Europe, um, in Spain and Portugal, they're really struggling with water. So that was the main thing. Like the people who are doing great, they have enough water. And the farmers are really struggling. They were like, it's a drought. We can't harvest or then in northern parts of, of Europe, it was kind of the rest. There was, we have too much water, we can't harvest. So it's it's always like these big problems always seem to be connected to water. And I wanted to, to, to know kind of, okay, how can I get more active? And my job was a bit too much. Um, it was too much computer stuff. So I wanted to get out of that and I wanted to get on the ground. And I've been a big friend um, of Oliver Gaucher. You might know him from the Regenerative Skills podcast. Um, and so we've been talking he said, Hey, I just spoke with Zach and he had this idea for a course, uh, that he wants to launch about water. And so I said, okay, as soon as that course is out there, um, I'm, I'm definitely gonna, gonna do it. So I wanted to join the course. And then when it came out, um, I was considering because it definitely felt expensive at the time. I didn't have a lot of savings, but I thought, okay, water is the one thing that I want to dedicate my life to. So it makes so much sense. Uh, to kind of do that so let's let's get active and so i joined the course and it taught me so many different things on a practical level that as i just said while doing the course i started getting jobs and it was kind of like oh uh, actually maybe i don't even need the certification i'm already getting all the jobs so that's why i just got the certification recently and um, yeah, I want to show you just a few of the different projects uh, that we worked on there to show kind of the different scales so the the, the small stuff that we started and then how everything got a little bit um, bigger. So at the beginning of the course, you do a lot of observation and you need to build kind of small models and small kind of features. So this is one of the first things I built. It's just an inflow, basically water coming from a terrace and there it's a concrete terrace. And before it just went down the drain. So I built this little feature to get it infiltrated into the ground. So something very simple here in the building process. So the idea is just how can I keep it from going down the down the drain, get it into the garden. So I built this channel. Um, yeah, so this is a little bit from above and that's connected to an infiltration basin. And I built this quite a while ago, but the sad thing is I still have never seen it full. 
because we're in a severe drought at the moment. So here on Tenerife, we normally get around 280 millimeters of rain. So that's, I think, 11 inches. And throughout the whole last year, we only got uh, 70 millimeters. So it's less than three inches of rain. So I thought, okay, how can I get more water into that? So I built this little thing on the road next to the house. So you can see it here, it's, it's filling up. So this takes road runoff, puts it uh, in, into a pipe. And then from there, it's also supposed to fill that. But this is the maximum amount of rain we had. So I still couldn't see it working. Hopefully soon, uh, I'll see it in, in action. But that's also one of the things you really need to adapt to. It might be really dry in your areas, and then you have to adapt your designs. And when you're too stuck in how you design things, then you might be screwed if, if conditions change. And so this is one thing we built um, during a workshop. So I was teaching a PDC together with my friend Edu, and we built this little infiltration basin um, together with students. So that was just a workshop we organized, and it was only planned to infiltrate, but we built it in July. And since then, it constantly had water in it. So it wasn't planned as a pond, but now it actually turned into a pond. And the cool thing is, uh, we actually made it onto the cover of Permaculture Magazine with our design. So this is the same little infiltration basin that we built. So now this is Edu, my friend who, who I was teaching with. And the cool thing is some um, people were following him and they saw our work and they were thinking, hey, I want that as well. So they reached out if we can work for them. So I got actually two clients through this. So actually by giving a workshop that was required to get certified, I already got clients. And this is one project um, that I was working on with Oliver. So just this just gives you a bit of an idea of kind of the topography. So the red areas are higher and the blue areas are lower. So it's a farm um, that we're working on. Here's a little bit of the analysis. And here, um, my path is a little bit different than, than Zach because I really like QGIS and kind of digital mapping as well. And Zach is definitely more on the, just working on the ground uh, side of things. So this gave me a bit of an idea of how the landscape looks from afar and where it might be interesting to, to get active. And here, this Oliver, for those of you who might only know his voice from the podcast. Um, and so we went onto the farm to see, okay, what can we do? What might make sense? Um, yeah, and what kind of work can we do there? And so this is what most of our work looked like uh, the first two days. So just digging test slices. Uh, that's one thing you'll definitely get into when, you, when you're doing a course or being what what are the kind of layers under the ground what kind of soil do we have is there enough clay to work with so we spent a lot of time there analyzing all the different spots where we wanted to build water bodies and dam walls um, and yeah it was really interesting because some spots on the map they look perfect perfect spot to build a dam it definitely should go there and then you do the test slicing and you realize there's no clay here it makes zero sense to build a dam here and so these are the kind of things where you really need to learn to to adapt and that's kind of stuff we did and this is another spot where it had rained a week before and we were always following a little bit of the water flows like where is it standing where is it flowing and so we realized there's one spot and close to it we were doing some test slices with the excavator driver and so we thought hey maybe good idea to test how the driver is behaving and how, how he's operating how good he is if we want to work with him long term and so we decided to let him not just do a little test slice but actually dig a little bit more and see how we can shape round shapes and build a bit of a pond and so we spent just one hour on this little um kind of test pond in a spot that we thought really asked to have water in it and then we did some armoring with the rocks and it's really just one hour a spontaneous thing and it's so fascinating because the clients of that property i think every two weeks they send us pictures and videos of this little pond and then they had frogs in it and they're like, look, look, it's working, it's working. And so it's really nice to see, you know, this was just spontaneous. We didn't put any key in, like no proper work. And we also told them like, hey, this thing is not going to hold long. We just wanted to see how it performs, but it's still holding. And it's exciting to see clients happy with, with work that you can do in just an hour. Um, and then this is kind of after the, uh, after the visit. So we realized, okay, we identified a few key spots where we can put in water bodies, where we can put, uh, we can hold water. We also have some plans for terraces and all that. And so quite likely with these really, really awesome clients, uh, they're awesome um, from the from the personal side. They also love experimentation. And quite likely this will be a project over the next years. So whenever we have time, we go out there. We have a week or two, we go out there, we build a water body, we build another dam, we build a terrace. And so continuous we, we're going to regreen this area and, and see what we can do there. Um, and then this is a different project. This is one of the ones that also came out of the little infiltration basin that we built 
um, together with Edu. And so this was just a super rough concept plan that I did to see, okay, these are kind of water bodies that we can build. This is what, what might be possible. No idea. I haven't visited the place before. So turned out um, it's going to be very different. But yeah, you see an idea, you know, like just from a distance, I was thinking, okay, we can build all these connected features and connect them with terraces and all that. Um, so this is kind of the vision for the place. And yeah, this is when we arrived um, and you can see all the black trees, it's all burned down. And that's also the sad part about this property uh, because it was burned down twice since the owners had it in the last 20 years, so in Portugal. And so that's why they reached out and they said, hey, can you rehydrate the landscape? We, we need some protection here. We need more water in the landscape. And so we reached out and this is one of the spots where we wanted to build. We wanted to start building at the top left. You can see the house so close to it. Um, and then there we got active uh, with Dave, who's also a student of the Water Stories course, and he lives there close by, so we're working with him. And here we found a great spot. Problem is we couldn't find enough clay, which was definitely an issue. So we thought, okay, we can't do a proper water body that will hold water long, but we can build an infiltration basin. So we had to kind of adapt. And here we started scraping away all the topsoil and, and digging. Uh, and there you can see um, the wall kind of building up. So lots of driving over it, compacting, compacting, another layer, finding clay, then putting it on. Um, and yeah, this was most of our work was really always with the laser level because it was really tricky to get the right balance between water volume in the water body, having a safe freeboard. So having enough space that when there's a heavy rainfall that the wall doesn't break, that the spillway is big enough. And there, I was also really glad that because of water stories and because of the professional development calls and, and those kind of things, I could reach out to Zach and I was like, hey, this is our catchment. This is the situation we have. What would you say? Should we add a bit more of freeboard? Should we make the spillway a bit wider? And that was great to have this kind of um, assurance in the back that, that we can do it. And so here, this is the inflow where we did a lot of rock armoring. So also after the course, you're going to love rocks and collecting them to make things erosion proof so this way water can go um, into it and yeah collecting rocks it's such a pain but um, yeah after that you're never going to complain about not having enough rocks on the land anymore <laughs> and yeah this is kind of when we when we finished it we also seeded everything so lots of seeds on the on the walls to make it safe and there on the on the top left you can see the spillway also rock armored um, yeah here this is the the rock armored spillway on the other side and yeah, this was a few days after there was the first rain. So you can see it's filling up. So that was, um, yeah, quite Nick, nice. I to think see there's a little lag in the pictures. There. there it is. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Um, yeah, this is um, another feature that we built there. We want to get more water onto the ridge. So a ridge pond uh, is what we wanted to build. But that was also super tricky with the spillway. We were working, but we realized there's trees in the way. And in Portugal, the cork trees are protected, so you can't take them out. And this is why the map is never accurate and why you shouldn't spend too much time and money on maps. So we had to adjust and we had to change everything to get around the trees. And then we realized it didn't fit with the spillway height anymore, so we had to rebuild that. And so I was really glad that the course was just focused on, hey, be flexible and work with the landscape instead of just making a fancy design and then having to ram it into the landscape somehow. And yeah, this was on the spillway frustration and realizing the level isn't high enough and then there wasn't enough freeboard. And yeah, so it was a lot of back and forth, but great learning experience. And then, yeah, this is spillway that we built. So kind of fanning out to get the, to get the flow out of it. Um, and yeah, there's a picture of, of above, so you can see a bit of the two terraces that take water with the 1% slope, bring it down, and then from there they go eventually into the water body that I that I showed at the beginning. Um, yeah, and then this is an aerial view of my news project that I'm working on. So this is super exciting. Also in Portugal, uh, 400 hectares. And the crazy part is it's not just supposed to be a farm, uh, but they're actually building an elephant sanctuary there. So the idea is to see there's so many captive elephants in many areas in Europe. And so the idea is to kind of get them out of zoos, out of circuses, and then instead of having to get them all the way back to their original countries in, in Asia or Africa, the idea is to have a sanctuary where they can all and have enough space and all that. So this is a project um, that we just started working on First of its kind, uh, so that's exciting. And this is one of the valleys 
where we will start working. So just a very small section of it where we're planning a few different water bodies and where they can then kind of enjoy life, swim in there, drink it and, and just play in the mud. And so when we were out there, you can see yeah, slightly bigger excavator. We were there doing test slices to see how much clay do we have. And yeah, most of the work <laughs> there was just also uh, a sex show before being in holes and seeing, okay, how much clay do we have? Uh, what can we do? So a lot of testing and seeing what's possible. And yeah, this was an exciting moment. We found a big nugget of clay. Uh, so really, really good clay. You could almost do pottery with it. So that, that was really exciting to see, okay, this, this is possible to work with. Um, and then I started designing it and, and coming up with ideas of, okay, where can we put water bodies? What can we do? Um, and then we actually had more time than, than expected. So we had two, three hours of excavator time and we were done with all the testing for, for different things. And we were like, hey, do you have something to do for the excavator? And I thought, okay, spontaneously, we don't have a laser level. I don't have anything prepared. What can we do quickly? Um, and those of you who watch Andrew Millison videos, and I guess that's all of you, you probably heard about continuous contour trenches that I used a lot uh, in India. And so I thought, okay, that's something that's small. It, it doesn't require too much planning. So we can do that. And so I got the excavator driver to do a bit of digging. And what you see here is a big mistake I made because we started too quickly. And at the bottom of it, you see those contour trenches are in straight lines. And that's one thing after the course, you will realize you never want to put straight lines into a landscape. They just really don't look good. Um, but I realized it too late, you know, I was just excited to get to get the project going. So the upper two lines, I got them to curve to to work a bit nicer with the landscape. But yeah, that's also the things that, that just happens, you know, you just uh, make some mistakes there. And um, this is a little bit of, of the plan of how they're supposed to work. So water flows from above, then it fills them. So kind of like a bathtub, they can fill up and then between them, it can flow onto the next level. And so this way we can infiltrate more water and kind of get the get the hydration on the landscape going. Um, yeah, and then the valley shape is kind of like this. So this is the rough idea to get a lot of the speed out of the water, infiltrate it, and then lower on. That's where we will build one of the first dams when I go back. And um, yeah, this is kind of what we're planning there to plant them with a bit of a different mix of, of grasses and trees or so fodder trees and grasses. And then the idea is to do a little bit of a silvopastural system with elephants. So yeah, it's, it's completely experimental. It doesn't really exist yet. So yeah, it's one of those things, you know, we're just going to try and, and see, see what happens. But the cool thing for me is they just reached out and they actually asked me if I can design the whole 400 hectare property uh, that will probably have somewhere between 20 and 30 dams. Yeah, so that's going to keep me busy for, for quite a few years. Um, and that's just the exciting thing about the course. Like, I really wasn't sure if I can afford the course, but I did it. And now every single project that I'm doing is paying for the course. So now I have people on waiting lists because I, I just don't have enough time. You know, it's always like a week, two weeks, three weeks of of working and we have to work in the right time of the year. So I need to choose, okay, I can do this project. I can do one feature there, one feature there. But I mean, I, I couldn't be happier. Like this is this is life now um, and kind of creating more life in the landscape, working with water. It's, it's super exciting. And yeah, also there we're planning to connect these features with terraces and all this. It's like, it's basically the things you do as a child playing with water in the, in the sand or on the beach. And now you get to do it on a large scale and it's actually benefiting landscape and climate for like, yeah, I can't think of anything more exciting. And yeah, this is actually from one of the first projects that we did when I really was a bit scared to put in bigger features in here. We just tiny terrace, 1% slope, bringing water from a dry spot onto, onto another one. And you can get started small. And then from there, you know, we, we kind of, leveled up a little bit and yeah this is just to to show what what our work mostly looks like so it's just being happy out there looking at clay looking at soil and playing with it uh yeah i, I can't think of anything that's more exciting and more purposeful and also pays the bills so yeah that's that's why i'm here awesome that's such a cool project nick i mean just imagine you know, it, it really does sound like what you might say you want to do as a kid. Like, I want to build landscape for elephants. It's just 
really incredible to see that come full circle. Um, and yeah, it, it's been really fun to watch and, I, you know, for people, um, who don't know about us. So what the course that Nick and I have been alluding to is the water stories core course. Um, and this is the program that I made to train other people to become practitioners, uh, seeing, you know, how much need there is for this in the world and how few people there are that can really do the projects with their own hands. Being one of those people myself, I thought, how do I make it so that, you know, hundreds or thousands of people have these skills and abilities, and really it could be millions. Uh, and so our advanced core course is kind of our premium offering. Uh, it's open for enrollment now uh, through the end of the month. Once it closes, it won't be open again until 2025. And this advanced course includes office hours with me. It includes access to the alumni membership afterwards to continue working and building your skills as a practitioner. Um, also to feedback on your uh, your actions so that you can see, you know, did you do something wrong with those set of rocks or is this along the right direction and get specific feedback for your projects as well that you're working on. Uh, and so it's really a way to, you know, start this process and learn and grow through the whole process and also be with others in that process to have these live office hours with myself and people from all around the world. And so these are really set up whether you want to do this professionally, like Nick or myself, where, you know, this is now what you're doing as your day job, in addition to it being a vocation or a passion whether you want to do it as a steward for your own landscape, if you're a farmer, rancher, landowner of any kind, or whether you don't want to, you know, do the actions yourself, but you want to be an advocate for this hopeful and positive message. You want to help your community understand what could be done and how to do it. Uh, and so in addition to this advanced course, we also have an essentials self-paced course um, that's available to join anytime. But then this advanced course people really love because you're in a six month group. And so every other week you're connecting with other people, you're sharing your projects, you're getting feedback and learning in community is oftentimes for many of us so much more fun than learning on our own. Uh, and so it's really useful for, you know, whichever type of person you are along this spectrum, uh, whether you want to figure out, okay, how do I start my business doing this? How much should I charge? How do I set up my agreements? Or if you just want to make the best decisions for your land or start to have real civil courage and be an outreach point in your community and be a voice for the voiceless. Uh, and so the course is modeled right along the same four phases of growth, discovery, experience, advocate, and practice. You have different actions in each one of these phases of growth that help guide you through the experiences you need to then be able to do this by the end of the course. Uh, and so Nick is an amazing, wonderful success story. And there's many success stories from all the people who have taken the course. Uh, Ayun and Lucia uh, developing their own project in Chile. And, you know, having a very difficult project where they really don't have almost any clay, uh, but, you know, the course gave them what they needed to get started. And it's really amazing to see they're educating their community, they're building beautiful gardens. But in this case, they even already have a spring on their land from the decentralized water retention that they've done. Their well level has come up a couple of meters, and this is all in just over a year's time. So it's really incredible how quickly these things can happen when you start moving in the right direction. Thomas and Francisco, also in Chile, who are doing this work all throughout the country, doing big projects in collaboration with forestry departments and, and also integrating syntropic agriculture into decentralized water retention. Uh, and so this is a really, it, it's something that helps people get over the, the bridge, the gap that exists between watching the videos and reading the books and actually being able to do these things with your own hands. And so they're creating beautiful projects um, all over and really helping a lot of people all throughout the country start to take on this kind of work. 
And there's so many other examples. Brian is a really great example in the Pacific Northwest, where similarly to Nick, you know, he's already too busy with projects. It can amazingly happen before you even know it, where you go from just wishing that someone would contact you to all of a sudden having too many people and having to select which projects you do. Uh, and he's doing a really great job, you know, teaching school groups about this on his farm uh, and te teaching people in the region what's possible through water cycle restoration. Uh, so we have a special offer for people on this webinar. Uh, if you join the course, uh, you're going to get all of the bonus lessons. These are all really practical project example bonus videos. They're almost each their own short course from examples on how to build the key, how to compact the clay, how to tell how much clay is in the material, uh, all the way up to uh, you know, how to develop a water cycle restoration plan for a region or how to do a site consult, all of the different examples you need to really actualize these teachings. Um, and so in addition to that, joining the advanced course gives you access to our alumni professional development, really amazing group of people from all around the world working, you know, every day, every week on this kind of work. Um, it also gives you certification and listing on our page as a practitioner. A lot of students find that they start getting jobs, you know, pretty shortly after doing the course because they're listed on that practitioner page. Uh, and then a special offer for you people on the webinar here is you can also get Sustainable Design Masterclass Lifetime Access, uh, which is a huge library of videos and all sorts of world leading experts. Um, and so this is all available for $4.85 a month uh, for six months throughout the course. And with that, we'd love to hear from you guys uh, and hear, you know, what questions do you have? What are your hangups in becoming a practitioner? Um, you know, what, yeah, what questions do you have about the course or what are the different challenges and struggles you've come across as you seek to become a practitioner? Uh, we've got one and you can also raise your hand folks if you wanna ask your question with your voice. Um, you can use that raise hand feature, uh, but we've got also you can put them in the Q&A uh, or in the chat itself as well. Um, so I guess we'll just kind of bounce around here uh, or Mitch, uh, you have a question in the chat and also have your hand up. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Awesome. Hey guys, um, so yeah, I'm in a weird spot where I'm like actually working for a regenerative agriculture company and I don't want to be at my desk anymore that does remote verification of ecosystem regeneration and I want to get my hands incredibly dirty. Um, I am wondering, like my biggest hang up here is one, lack of experience. Um, you know, I would love to learn to drive all this heavy machinery and operate it. Uh, I know how to read a contour map. I know where water wants to be a lot of the time. Um, I've been in the permaculture and region ag space for three, four years now. Um, so my biggest hang up is time. I've been enticed by this course for years now. I'm wondering what the time commitment is to do a really good job at this. Like I wanna send it. I wanna get my hands dirty and wet and I want, I want to live and breathe it. Like, what is the time commitment other than like the rest of my life? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> love that. Um, so there, the way that we've set up the course is to try and be as flexible as possible. So there is a, there's a lot of different ways you can go about these actions. And essentially the more time you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it in the end. Mm -hmm. What I say as a time commitment is two to 10 hours per week, every week. Um, I think two hours is kind of the bare minimum. If you don't have that, you should you know, take the course at a different time. Um, but if you're really gonna go into the deepest on all of these actions, it could take 10 or even 20 hours some weeks. Um, so it, I think it kind of averages out two to 10 per week, but Nick, would do you wanna, what are your thoughts as a former student? Um, yeah, I think that's a pretty good 
estimate, but I also want to add like it, it really depends and the causes for you. And so the different exercises are, are structured in a way that you can put in more or less depending on what you find most valuable. Um, and so some of the exercises are really about kind of observation and, and also there's some research that you need to do about your watershed and, and all these kind of things. And you need to decide what you want to get out of it. Um, and so for me, I'm so practical. And also when I was doing the course, I was still working full time for climate farmer. So I was really focusing my work on the practical things. So I spent lots of time on the like building small models, building rain gardens, uh, this kind of work. And on the exercises that were more involved with um, kind of the writing and research, I definitely did less work on those. Um, so I think to get the minimum to get certified, it's not that much, but you realize when, when you start doing them, it's really not like a university or, or school where you're required you know, to do it to pass. It's more like, okay, here is a great way for you to develop and you can put in as much effort as you want and, and do it. So yeah, I think two hours minimum makes sense. Probably to 10, yeah. And if you if you keep up with it, it's also great. It's totally possible. Or you can also do it like me, you know, um, doing the course. And then I was getting so much work that I actually didn't get certified. And now almost two years later, I was like, ah, actually, I've done all the things now. I can just submit it and get certified. So also an option for you. Okay, interesting. Um, I'm interested in all the different routes, the advocate, professional, steward. Um is it, it's pretty fluid. I'm assuming you can like get into the course and then it's you can basically have all the content to do all three. Yeah. So all the, it, it's a little bit confusing. We're going to, you know, improve how we're talking about it, but basically all of the content is the same and you can change pathways whenever you like. The difference is which actions are required for certification. So for example, the advocate pathway we've created so that someone with no access, land access, can complete the course on the advocate pathway and then get the advocate certification. Whereas the professionals, there's a lot you have to do to earn the Water Stories professional certification. And also it does, you know, you can complete it over time. Many people will complete the course on advocate or steward while they're completing the actions for professional and then a year or two later they've done their first client they've done their first real job and now they're ready for the professional certification um, and like nick mentioned too all of these actions it's very easy to get in the mindset of school and you have to do the homework to show that you learned it none of these actions are for us they are all for you and they're all designed to prepare you with the story, the background, the information, and the experience to impart real change in your region. So, for example, one of the actions is create a regional restoration plan. This is to engage all the things that you've learned and apply them to your place, not so that we see your rest regional restoration plan, but so that in five years, when the State Department is asking you, well, what would you do? Because now you have some credibility in the water space, you can have this idea already in back of mind that, oh, if we were gonna do this on a big scale, boom, 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 here's the list. Uh, and so it's really, it's all stuff that is to support your journey as a practitioner. Uh, and that's why the more you put into it, the more you get out of it, because mm -hmm. it all just feeds into where you end up at the end of the six months and then afterwards. Cool. I just have one more question and that's about uh, access to the course content. Um, I'm assuming you have limited access to the course content. I'll just quickly glancing over, or is that the difference between the advanced and the, the practical? Uh, limited in terms of time or? Yeah, in terms of yeah. time. So we, I mean, it's set up where Really, you can have the course forever if you want it, um, but the way that you do that is by joining the alumni membership after the course. So as part of the advanced course, uh, you have the course for the whole completion of the course. Um, then if you want to continue on, you can join the alumni membership, which is $48 a month if you complete the course or 96 if you don't complete the course to incentivize completion. Mm -hmm. um, and then... You actually, not only do you continue to have access to the course indefinitely, but you have more than 30 hours of additional content uh, that's in the membership area. 
And really important is the monthly professional development sessions where we get together all the different practitioners and you can put yourself in the hot seat, for example, and say, hey, I've got this big challenge I need everyone's input on, or just ask about your specific project and say, here's what I'm thinking, get feedback, um, or just you know understand how other people are navigating the issues they're coming across. Uh, so it's, I think that ends up being one of actually the biggest values of the course is that, you know, for example, when you're building a dam in a year's time and you're thinking, ah, is this right or not? If you're part of that alumni membership of practitioners, you can ask me and others and get quick feedback uh, so that even, you know, while Nick was digging on site, I was letting him know, well, like, okay, here's the things to factor in. Um, so I think that's one of the big things that we've seen with courses is you do a course and then you get no more support and fall off the map. And it's really hard to, you know, if I had just done that one course with SEP, I would have never gotten where I am today. And so we set it up as a timeline so that you can take the course, you can be part of the membership long term. Then we have both volunteer opportunities and in-person intensives only for people who have already done the course. So you can actually then continue to get experience on projects, um, whether in a workshop or a volunteer setting. Very cool. Okay, thank you very much. I'll uh, see you at water school. Awesome. Awesome, thank you, Mitch. Um. Water story, someone who joined from the community here that I'm going to ask to unmute. Uh, but I'm not sure your name. Because, yeah, there you go. Oh, hello? Yes, hello. Hi, my name is Jenny Nazak. I am a sustainability educator in Daytona Beach. I do writing and public speaking and also have a landscaping business. And I'm a permaculture uh, designer. I work with hand tools and my mode is to empower other people to work on projects together. So I would be the person wanting to employ 50 people with shovels. Now, is there a way while taking this uh, core course to either translate in our own minds, oh, this is how, this is the mechanized equipment, but this is how it would work with 50 of us with shovels, or do you explicitly at all address uh, that sort of uh, uh, mode as well? Both, very much so. Um, you know, it's, we really are low on recipes and high on approach. And okay. so the way that the course is set up, you don't need to touch a piece of equipment to do anything throughout the course. You can do it all with a shovel. And we show projects of, you know, here are the contexts where equipment can help. Here are the contexts where human labor can accomplish the same things. And we definitely implement both. It's, you know, kind of a question of what's more available um, and what fits into the context. There are some constraints for each um, that we also touch on, but it, you certainly don't need to be working with equipment for this course to work for you. Uh, and in fact, you know, you can go through the whole course without firing up a, a piece of equipment at all. That's good to know. Thank you. Because we have a dual problem in our community. We have, I, I believe, a need for a career path for a lot of young people to, uh, to ramp up onto. And also, meanwhile, at the same time, we have a very large, what you might call landscape maintenance industrial complex that is undermining our stormwater sponge and they're being paid handsomely to do it. So I'm wanting to offer an attractive alternative for, for the young people and others who are wanting to be part of a solution. So thank you for this. I love your work. I really appreciate you guys. I share and quote you widely. <laughs> Awesome. And, uh, you know, this sounds like, you know, everything why we created the course really to give because we see similarly, there's so many young people that go to university, get an environmental studies degree or environmental sciences. And then, you know, maybe they end up doing something that's not actively moving in the wrong direction, but they're not really empowered to help in the way that they intended when they started that journey. Um, yeah. And so we look at 
our program is actually providing a lot more valuable value than a university education in that you have a marketable skill by the end of it, but also for a fraction the price so that you're not going into this huge debt to then do this. Um, so it, it's set up very much with that in mind of how do we train other young people who want to do good to be able to do that good and also make their income in the process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for the question. Spiros. And please tell me if I'm uh, saying your name wrong as well. No, you got my name, Spiro. Uh, so I'm calling you from Athens, Greece. I have uh, a couple of questions. Uh, the, the people who've spoken to you, as well as Nick, who spoke, all have some background uh, in this. For someone who has zero background, like a musician who suddenly has taken a hankering to the land, maybe spent a few months on uh, an organic farm at most, there are a few things, and I was interested in this. Is this a wise thing to start with, a big course like this? Is it? Uh, I don't fully understand the the scale, the levels of the course. And I noticed Nick did met, refer to Andrew Millison. Is it, does Andrew Millison compliment? Is he unnecessary if you take this course? Because, uh, you know, OSU, Oregon State has a variety of, uh, you know, courses in these sorts of things. So I guess maybe you can enlighten me on that. Yeah. Um, and now I'll, I'll preface it that, uh, you know, obviously I'm a bit biased, but I think, in a way, I actually think sometimes our course can be most beneficial if you have no previous experience, because you don't have preconceived notions of how certain things should be. Um, so we've had artists take the course and apply this to their art. We've actually had a lot of artists and musicians take the course and apply this to their work or start including this in their work. Um Sometimes, honestly, with clients, the ones with the least previous knowledge can sometimes be the easiest to work with because they don't have all these preconceived notions about why things should be a certain way. So I think if you really have if you have enough time to put into the course, I would say it. I don't think it's ever a foolish decision. I don't think anything would be in over your head. Um, the way that we guide you through it, we assume no knowledge beforehand. So that discovery phase, you know, that's starting with a blank slate. Um, so I think it for people who have done other programs, it helps fill in the gaps of the practical know-how of how to do it rather than just the, the design conceptual side. Um, but for people who haven't taken a course or something different, I think it's almost a little bit easier to learn this approach because you're not already thinking about doing it a different way. Um, I think, for example, that's one of the reasons why I had an easier time learning from SEP than a lot of uh, my contemporaries who were also learning from them in that they had a permaculture training and then they started working with SEP. And it's similar, it's pointed at the same thing, but there's some big differences as well. And I came into, I found SEP first and then permaculture later. Um, and so, yeah, I think both can be beneficial. It can help fill in the blanks a lot, um, especially one of the big things I think it fills in the blanks is how to do this professionally and make a job out of it. You know, how much you should be charging, how to estimate projects, how to get clients. Usually a lot of courses will teach you the technical, but none of the managerial and the technical is core and important, but that's maybe only 20% of the day-to-day -day things that you need to know to be effective at it. Um, so I think it, yeah, I think it helps round out other stuff, but it also, you don't have to have any um, previous experience. Whereas for example, for in-person intensives, the core course is a prerequisite because when we get to those, we're just going right into work and here's how you do things. And we're not covering any of the concepts or classroom stuff. Um, and so this, they really help support each other. Cause then when we get together on site, we can just get right down and dirty and don't have to worry about any of the, uh, the conceptual or classroom side of things. So for someone who wants to start on his own property, uh, 
Again, will you start with one of your, with not the full on course, but then in due time, uh, complete it, you know? Yeah, yeah, you can do that. And you could take essentials and then join a future advanced. I think the big difference with advanced is going through it with a class of other people and myself. Mm -hmm. And so if you have time over six months to do that, I would recommend the advance, even if you're not going to get all the actions done right away. I think, you know, a lot of people, okay, and Nick, you, can, you, you, can, you can kind of finish that other stuff, perhaps like Nick at a, at a later time. Now, again, one of the things you both point out, especially you, Zach, is uh, the fact that you had mentors. Uh, you, you don't learn surgery from a book. Uh, similarly here, I'm sure uh there is there's a place right how do we get the mentor how do we organize something like a mentorship you know what i mean the, to really see this in action because it, it, still it's videos it's it's book basically you may have given more breadth and depth to it from your experience than you know maybe a professor at the university but in the end it's still a, there's still a step a distance from the actual doing yeah, the so two answers there. Um, one is that, you know, one of the actions that's required for a professional in the course is to get a mentor. And so part of the course actually teaches, you know, how would you find this mentor? How would you identify? And how do you get your foot in the door? How do you endear yourself to them and start learning from them? So it's set up in a way that it pushes people to find local mentors. And through the process of the advanced course, I'm providing as much mentorship as I can from afar. Um, so it, it's a it's a really critical piece with the mentorship and it's really a two-pronged approach. How do we give people remote mentorship and how do we help people find a local mentorship as well? So uh, for Mediterranean climate, like Southern Greece, dry, hot, no rain, four, five, six months of the year, um, can you, is your course helpful for this particular region? And can you connect me with mentors in this region? Definitely the course is helpful. I it's it's not like we have a, a library of mentors for you to select from, but rather okay. we help educate you on how to find your mentor in that area. Uh, because a lot of times these mentors are easier to find locally than globally, if and, that makes okay, sense. Well, I mean, Nick is closer to Europe, but are there people that can help down here, Nick? Um, yeah, that's it's not a project. And I think also in the Water Stories community, we have thousands of people. So mm -hmm. in there, just saying like, hey, this is my context. And quite often, it doesn't need to be the exact same location, but it can be very similar from a context. You know, right, you have right, the right. same kind of climatic patterns. And so that can, that can also help a lot asking in there. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Spiros. Ethan. Hey, Zach, how are you today? Good. How are you doing, Ethan? Doing really well. I'm calling in from Austin, Texas. And I was wondering about the course. Do you all go over tax incentive perspectives for starting off a business so they don't start off with debt in the beginning of starting off a business like most business owners do without a friend or a loan in most cases, or even the possibility of working with nonprofits and making it an educational service that gives their business prospect as well as marketing. Yeah, there, I, you know, the big thing we focus on again is approach. So we definitely, you know, I basically I share, I put everything on the table as far as how I have things set up and how I think is best to set up things. Um, how I structure my agreements, subcontractors, uh, all of those kinds of things. But I, it's definitely not like a one-stop guide for all of that. Um, but also one of the things that, you know, I similarly try and help people do is realize how to start a business doing this without any cash outlay. Um, I think even beyond not taking on debt, you can do it in a way where you don't really have much cash outlay. 
uh, and it's it's easy to get attached to, you know, like we're making earthworks with excavators. We got to buy an excavator. But actually, that doesn't make sense in most situations. And we explain why that doesn't make sense and how you can, you know, maybe charge 10 percent more on the final bill to just rent all of your equipment in perpetuity and have exactly what you need when you need it. Um, so what I try and do is lay out exactly how I do things with the idea that people can then take what they like and also adjust what doesn't feel quite right in that setup. And, you know, if they already own an excavator, they're going to go about things in a little bit different way. And that's good as well. Um, so it's, yeah, we, we try and give an honest view and some clear recommendations uh, as far as the best ways to approach it as I see them. If you don't mind me asking, do you like to push the community of human forced labor intensive of, of having volunteer days where they can make them educational instead of having to hire people or having to buy the excavator, making it those affordable strategies for people in regions where they have a community that they may not be aware of or a food forest that they can, again, take your teachings to and start sharing with the community? Yeah, I mean, that's a really great way to go. And I think the advocacy pathway kind of leads in that direction. Um, and there are plenty of projects where we're working with, you know, human power, whether it's volunteer or for, um, for pay. So it definitely can be done. I will say the the volunteer piece has some challenges in that a lot of untrained volunteers are not usually very helpful to actually getting the project done. Um, so for example, we used to sometimes have volunteers on projects. Now I will have any water story student as a volunteer and no one else because most people require more time and attention from me taking me away from doing the work than they actually end up contributing towards the project. Um, now, it is very contextually based too. There are plenty of projects where volunteers can help tremendously with the work that's being done. And then there are other projects where it's a little bit more of a challenge. Um, and, and so I think it's definitely possible and it makes a lot of sense in certain contexts. And through the advocacy, you can really build the community to do that kind of work. Um, but there are different challenges as well there. And so sometimes it's easy to look at afar and, and think it's going to work out really well. And I will say when we have projects that um, we're doing with volunteers and we're not hired to finish the project, I set the expectation is that the project is not going to be finished. When the volunteers are done, the project will be furthered, but not finished. And so I think if you're able to accommodate for that and fill in the gaps and finish at the end, that could be a really good strategy. That makes perfect sense. And I completely agree. Thank you very much for the seven years of experience I've had. Thankfully, we have a nonprofit here in Austin where we're the first school to start selling the eggs and vegetables back to the cafeteria from the permaculture work of you and Matt Powers. I've been learning. Awesome. That's great to hear. Brett, Brett Bauer. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. I, I just have a couple of questions and I got on late, so um, maybe you've touched on some of this, um, but uh, I forget the, the woman's name who's working in Florida and she's working with lots of uh, hands and unmechanized projects. Um, on the other end of the spectrum from that, from that space, what can we expect from the um, the advanced track uh, to gain as a as equipment operators? Because I, I know the level of skill and the cost of, of, of being on this uh, on equipment, and um, quickly quickly the core the cost of your course could be you know eclipsed, uh, and you might not get a whole lot of work done, right? Um, but so I I. I know I can get on my own tractor and, and be doing stuff and I'm not using the best tool for the job, but I don't feel like, okay, if I go rent an excavator and I might 
waste a whole lot of money, you know, kind of getting my, working my way up the learning curve. You know what I mean? Um, not even from an approach standpoint or what I'm trying to do, but just in operating the equipment. So I've just, how do you guys touch on that or support the, that, that progress and technical abilities? Yeah, great question. Um, and you, you point out something that's very important in that your first hours on a machine, you're pretty much useless. Um, you yeah. know, that you have the tractor to practice on, that's great because a lot of the same dexterity is going to apply. Um, and one of the things we try and do is help people understand, do you want to be operating the machine yourself or working with a local operator? I think the local operator tract gets you to working efficiency quicker, but not peak efficiency. Whereas operating yourself, it's less efficient in the beginning, but then more efficient once you build the skill. Um, for example, we have a whole video just on excavators. We call it Excavator 101, where it teaches you, you know, all the safety things, what the controls do, the basic skills, things to look out for. So if you were to rent an excavator for a day or a week at, at the same time as that video, I think you could pretty quickly become fairly proficient or at least safe on the excavator, which is the most important piece. Um, but like you're saying, there's going to be some expense in learning that tool as well. And so it's finding a balance between that. One thing that I did myself uh, that I also talk about a lot in the course is working with a local operator and then also operating myself. So right. he owned an excavator and then we would rent an excavator and then the project can still happen quickly. And if there's something I can't do, he can step in to do it, but I'm also building skill in that process. Um, so depending on the scale of projects that you're taking on, there's different routes that you could go for learning the, the actual equipment skills. Excellent. I appreciate that. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to go through a little, I'll try and be quick, but it's a couple of questions I'd like to ask. I've done a number of other, you know, programs similar, not, not, uh, not the subject matter, but, you know, similar kind of platform. Um, and uh, things that I struggled with with the scheduling and, and it not being consistent and, and moving around based on the, facilitators, other scheduled activities. And I'm wondering how how um, you guys, you know, what can I expect in terms of consistency and scheduling? Yeah, so I, we are very consistent, I'll say. Since we started doing the course, my Mondays and Tuesdays have been the same thing ever since then. Um, so we, so most of the video is, or most of the content, sorry, is asynchronous where you can access at any time based on your schedule. The one thing that is synchronous is the live office hours. And those happen Monday evenings and Tuesday mornings to accommodate for all of the different global time frame zones that we have. Um, and so we have a survey now that people are filling in what time zone they're in, then the first week of the course, we'll have a poll for people to choose when they want the office hours to be. And then based on that, we'll pick that time and it will stay that time over the whole six months. Excellent, excellent. Uh, and how many, do you cap the advanced course, uh, the number of participants or? Yeah, we do. Um, it's, it, a little bit of a loose cap uh, there's not like a, a real firm number but we do cap it and we're uh a little bit more than two-thirds the way there right now okay um and then it just this is our context uh we're very sandy we have a the topography is lends itself and the climate lends itself to this type of work tremendously it's in, uh, but it's a very sandy soil and i I'm just imagining, uh, you know, I have a great place to train here at home, um, but working with clay might be, uh, I'm imagining a limiting factor. Maybe I'll learn, you know, how to find clay a lot. I'm sure I will, right? Um, but I'm imagining where we need, 
you know, impoundments of water uh, that we'd like to be, some, you know, fairly um, seepage proof. That might be a challenge in my context. Do, do you guys, what's, in terms of the approach, do you, how do you guys play with liners and what's your attitude towards that? Yeah, for me, a, a liner is a last option if there's really nothing else and it's really necessary. Um, I'll say that, so there is a very real factor that you could be limited in what you can accomplish if there's really just no clay. Um, I go to a lot of places and talk to a lot of people that say they have no clay, but they actually do have clay. It's just not right at the surface. And so they haven't found it yet. Um, so definitely, and there's lots of landscapes where, you know, where you want to build the pond is not going to work because the clay is not there, but somewhere else there is the clay. And so you have to adjust what you're doing to that landscape. Um, in addition, we do cover working with outside clay, bringing clay into a site, um, and bentonite clay, if you have to do that. And so for me, the scale goes, ideally, we're just working with the local materials. If that's not going to work, can we bring in semi-local materials to work with? If that's not going to work, now the other piece is there's all these different strategies other than just building a pond that you can use right. to rehydrate your landscape. So usually if those first two aren't going to work, we're going to go into that third trajectory of what are the alternate strategies that make sense for this landscape and for these goals. And then if within that, we really need to create a water holding vessel you know, we, I will answer questions on how to do liners and we do have some sections um, that touch on it, but also why I don't like them <laughs> uh, just because of the short-term viability, the high cost All and right. the yeah. low ecological impact. Absolutely. No, all, all good. Thanks for, thanks for touching on those issues. Yeah. Great questions. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. Alexios. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you're a little choppy, but we hear you. All right. Um, I just have a question about the courses that you're offering. I wasn't clear on what exactly they are. You said there's a self-paced one, which doesn't offer certification. There's one other, and then there's an advanced, which has the, the advocate um, and the and the professional certification is that right oh well so there's really you could think of it as the same course with two different formats so both courses are the same base content then there's the essentials that's self-paced in the advanced that is with a live cohort over six months feedback on your options and certification for completion um, and so then the the pathways whether it's professional steward or advanced become relevant in the advanced course because based on which actions you complete, uh, that determines which level of certification you can achieve. Okay, so there's only two essential courses. There's a self-paced and then the advanced, which has these three different options depending on what you want. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, just so I'm clear, the the advocate and the and the steward pathways, you're doing all the same material except you're not uh, required to complete certain tasks. Is that the only difference? Yep, exactly, exactly. So really, the the pathway it doesn't change your experience in the course. It just changes which actions you need to do to achieve that level of certification. And you can change that throughout oh, as well, so anytime you want to. If you start on the professional track and then you say, oh, I don't have enough time for this, you can downgrade and vice versa. You can change it anytime throughout the process. Um, so it's you don't have to think about that. Really, the question is, do you want to do self-paced or live with a class? And that's either essentials or advanced. Um, and then for those seeking certification, that pathway becomes relevant just in which actions are required, but you have all the same material, all the same actions. You can do any action on any pathway. 
Uh, it's just for that certification level. Oh, okay. So then what are the total number of actions? Uh, are there 12 total actions that you do over the course of the six months if it's every two weeks? It's or is it more compact? It's well, it's actually more than that. Um, now, not all act some actions are more difficult and some actions are less, but it's probably I actually don't know off the top of my head a total number, but it's probably 20 or 30 total actions because a number of modules have multiple actions, uh, especially on the professional pathway. And some actions are quite simple, like okay. go outside and, and there's, rainstorm. Is there an and other actions are more complicated, like build a rain garden or build a water body. Right, right. I was curious about that. How many, I was curious what the percentage of the course involves actually manipulating the land. Um, in terms of the actions, it's relatively small. Um, a lot of the uh, the initial actions all focus on land reading, observation, historical context. Then in the experience part, the actions really focus on doing the work on the ground, gaining skills, building features. And then the third phase, the actions are really around community activation and understanding uh, you know, what needs your community has and, and how to speak to them. And then the actions in the fourth phase are all geared for those wanting to start a business. And so they're, you know, have your first site visit, do your first proposal, uh, things along those, that nature. Oh, okay. 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 So there's, it gets more, each section, is it uh, like a month and a half? What's the, length of each section uh, yeah so it's a new module every other week um and three modules per phase so six weeks per phase okay uh, okay and so each of them focus on a different aspect of water management yep um, exactly and on really your yeah, overall so journey Yeah, yeah. So the, the first six weeks are more learning about how to observe, what to, what to observe, how to observe. Is that correct? Yep, yep. And also I, understanding see, the like, history see, like, of your landscape split. and the, um, you know, where your water is coming from. Uh, the first phase is really that discovery. So it's all around discovering as many aspects around the water cycle of your local context as possible, then that second phase, the second six weeks, uh, is where there's a lot of, you know, manipulation of earth and things of that nature. Okay, so in the second phase, you're doing things in the earth. Yep. And then... Is that correct? And then the third phase, you're learning how to advocate, how to talk about it, how to express it. I guess learn the theory of it so you can explain it to other people. You're kind of solidifying the idea of it. And uh, then partially, the a lot phase, of the theory is in the first phase as well, but really how to how to uh, talk to others about it is that third phase. And then that fourth phase is how to build a business doing it. Okay. Okay. I see. And then the through line in all of that is you're learning more and more about uh, the process of management um, in yep. each phase. I, that's what I'm, that's how I'm exactly. seeing this. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. And so, for example, you know, in okay. that last phase, you'll also observe some of the interactions that you did in that second phase and you know know what you learn from them and what you do differently uh, or what worked really well and the, also the actions aren't required you know you can do the actions at any time they have to be completed by the end of the course to get certification but you don't have to do them exactly on that time schedule depending on you know what season you're in when you have land access and what else is going on in your life
Uh, okay. Okay. And then we're communicating with you in a forum with the other students while we're learning uh, yep. throughout the weeks. Is that correct? That and then uh, live office hours every other week as well. So calls, the Google Meet calls, like a Zoom call uh, every uh, other week focused for each module. And then also the community forum of there's two that you gain access to. One is the students of this course. And then the other is all of the students from all of the previous rounds of the course. Uh, so you can share, they can share experiences with you and you can bounce ideas off of them for what they've learned, this sort of thing. Exactly. Okay. Okay. I, I'm imagining that the self-paced course is also a cheaper option. Is that why, is that one of its benefits, one of its uh, yep. characters? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much for answering my questions. I guess if I may, the last question I have is about uh, workshop opportunities and internship opportunities that are offered to the students in this course. Um, I heard, um, I think from Ms. Megan, who I spoke to, that there are, there's a, like in July, there are some projects that uh, might be a Occurring where students will be invited uh, or workshops. What's the nature of that? Yep. So that's where we have two different types of experiences workshops and volunteer opportunities. Uh, and so the workshops are where students pay to attend those. Um, and it is all focused around student experience. And so getting you time on an excavator, time doing all the different things, surveying with you know, people more experienced looking over your shoulder. And then the volunteer opportunity, you don't have to pay to participate, um, but the goal is to get the project done. And so it's not as focused around a learning experience. It's, it's learning by doing rather than a more curated learning experience. Um, and so we'll have different options for each of these um, where we have a, an in-person intensive in the U.S. this July. Uh, we will have another Water Stories workshop uh, just for students in the fall in October in Italy for a smaller group of students. Um, and then we have a, a couple of tentative projects that might, uh, I think we're also looking at a workshop in South Africa um, though that might be more of a public workshop. Um, so then in addition to those two, we also have public workshops that are open to people who haven't done the course. Uh, but for people who have done the course, it's, you know, it, it's kind of duplicative. It's, it's a lot of the introductory stuff in the course. Okay, great. So we, I guess students would be notified when these opportunities arise that they could participate? Yep. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Notified for both the volunteer and the workshop opportunities uh, as they're available. Great. Thank you so much for answering those questions. That's really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And we are more and more really trying to uh, select the projects that are open to being workshops. Um, so we we are wanting to create as many of those as we can. Thank you. Take care. God bless. Thank you, Alexios. Oh, let's see. Nick, are you? Are there any questions you want to touch on or pull to the surface? Um, I think you really went through a lot. Let me see if I find any that didn't answer yet. Ah, yeah, this one. Um, if you do self-paced, can you upgrade to professional with a future cohort later? I think that's uh, interesting. Yep. And yeah, the short answer there is yes. Uh, you can take essentials and then join a future advanced course. Um, and we'll, we'll do something similar in the future, but it might not be exactly the same. But right now, we're letting people apply their essentials tuition towards this coming advanced course. Uh, so for anyone who's done essentials and wants to upgrade, you can do it pretty, pretty reasonably. Um, and also for people either watching this later, uh, if you don't 
get the deadline for this course, you could similarly join Essentials and then join the Advanced in 2025. Another community guest, I'm going to ask you to unmute because not sure your name. Hi, guys. Uh, it's Pietro. <laughs> um, hey, I'm Pietro. Just, I uh, enrolled recently in your advanced course as I'm keen to get into the professional route. Um, one of my main worries is uh, I'm, I'm in a quite interesting situation um, now. Uh, um, I recently quit my job looking for uh, uh, a better career uh, in nature and helping nature and uh, doing my bit uh, towards a better climate. Um, and, and to do so, I sort of moved and traveled all the way to Portugal uh, in my little van and volunteering and looking for volunteering opportunities here uh, of different platforms. Uh, and I'm just a little worried I uh, about, you know, taking this advanced course and com having committed to certain uh, volunteering position that might uh, not have, uh, you know, the land or the spaces or the time for me to sort of apply these things um, so uh, is that something uh, would it be better to take the essential and then uh, look for other things or do you think because i'm changing places every three to four weeks maybe i'm i think it would work out but uh, yeah i'm just <laughs> seeking reassurance because uh, i'm really uh, keen on this advance pathway and professional pathway. Uh, I want to hear your opinion, really. <laughs> yeah, the I mean, I could actually, I, I could see some benefits to it as well. For example, in the land reading, you're going to be able to observe different landscapes throughout the course. Now, mm -hmm. there's some drawbacks in not being able to, um, you know, see the same landscape again and again over the full six months, but that's definitely not going to hold you up. Um, so it's, yeah, I think you kind of have your own benefit in that. I think as long as you have the time to participate, I would advocate advanced over essentials because I just see that it's so much more fun with other people and with the live engagement. Um, yeah, and I would agree. And I think one thing that you might consider as you accept different volunteer positions is if you can accept volunteer positions where people are interested in this kind of thing, that in Portugal, yeah. you'd think every one of them are going to be interested in it. Yes. Um, you might actually provide a huge amount of value to them that, you know, it could be really a win-win where they give you a little more leeway to experiment with things because you're doing something that they find valuable. Yeah, that was my thought process as well. <laughs> yeah, it's just a matter of finding, you know, the, the right channels to to find these opportunities as well. I guess. Well, thank yeah, you. I was actually making money that way. Maybe that helps you as well. So while I was volunteering to gain experience, I was teaching other volunteers, and then I thought, hey, maybe I can also do workshops. So in my years of volunteering, I was often giving workshops on the places where I was volunteering and I was gaining money from those workshops. So that way you can kind of combine multiple things. You can learn, you can complete your certification by doing the workshop and you can even gain some, some money on the land. Oh, thanks for the tip. <laughs> I'll, I'll think about it <laughs> when I get there. Cool. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you. I see a question from Tony. Um, how involved uh, is the question about uh, getting a mentor? Um, how involved is this? Uh, does one have to go through an additional cost in getting a mentor as well? Um, uh, you know, I will say I have never had to pay a single mentor. Um, and if your mentor is asking for payment, you've set up that arrangement in the wrong way. 
I think one of the big things about mentor apprenticeship arrangements is you need to give value first and then ask for value. So for example, my mentorship with John Hemmick House, I was helping him prune in the greenhouse for hours and hours and hours, and he was teaching me about pruning as we were doing it. So I was helping him as he was helping me. It's very important to realize with mentors is you need to make yourself useful to them where they want to keep you around and keep educating you because you are helping their efforts so much. Um, and so the, that's part of you know what we dive deep into within the course is how to curate that kind of relationship. And it's also why we don't ask you to just pick one mentor. We ask you to pick three mentors and then try and become a, have a build an apprentice relationship with all of them because inevitably one or two of them is not going to work out uh, and you got to find the right person for you and for them as well because it's very much a, a matchmaking kind of a thing. And there was also one question, maybe you can go into that about working with government organizations and regulations and how, how tricky that is, how that is developing, maybe share a bit about your experience. Yeah, that's a great point. So this is one of the things where a lot of people run into challenges uh, and you need to be really aware of you know, the different ways and approaches that you can go about things. Um, and so this is definitely something we cover in the course, how to call the child by the right name. And that's going to be specific to your region, to their local initiatives in your region. Um, and so again, the course isn't going to tell you, call it a fire mitigation, decentralized water retention landscape, because you have to change it to what makes sense in your landscape but it's gonna help you understand, okay, what are the concerns of local people? Then how do I name this in a way that it's gonna be acceptable? And then whether through the yin or the yang of regulation management, how do you navigate that situation? Um, and there are different approaches. I think they both have value for different people. And we try and paint the options so that you can gravitate towards the solution that best fits you. Yeah, maybe they're also from practical experience. So when we're working in Portugal, there's a lot of restrictions around waterways and all this. So there we also stay flexible. And sometimes in the streams, in the officially registered streams, you're not allowed to do anything. But then what we're doing now is often that we're working with a bit of a terracing system. So basically we're taking water with the terrace slightly sloped and getting just outside the protected area. And then in there we're building and all that. So that's also why this course is so much for focus on, on staying flexible in the landscape and then you get to see oh, okay this is the maximum water allowed that you can build in a water body and then you kind of stay stay flexible so yeah it's it's definitely tricky and many of the regulations they're also really not clear so specifically in portugal no one really knows what is allowed and what isn't like we've been doing research for months and then you kind of need to see and yeah i think one of the biggest things is working decentralized with small features Rather have lots of small ones that are connected and don't build a gigantic dam that takes months to build. Absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. Uh, I see a good question here. Um, some challenges that both of you have experienced with doing earthworks. Um, has there been any challenges with collaborating with governmental organizations, county, et cetera? I'm interested in collaborating with U.S. Forest Service, DNR, uh, and I'm wondering if you all have collaborated with any of these organizations. Um, so we kind of mentioned the maybe the more negative friction side of that with the previous question, um, but there also is lots of opportunity for positive collaboration. And so, for example, Tomas and Francisco are working with their forestry department in Chile in a certain region to implement this kind of work. Um, I'm in talks and engaged with the Department of Defense and the Marine Corps about implementing this kind of work on some of their installations. Um, and so while there is some resistance in some veins, there are other threads where there's actually a lot of funding available and interest in these kinds of things. Um, similarly, a, a friend of Nick and I's that we've mentioned, Oliver, 
submitted a bunch of proposals for his place. And he thought the one that they wouldn't accept was the crazy water restoration one. And they'd accept the normal ones. It turns out it was exactly the opposite. They rejected all the normal ones and accepted the water conservation one. Um, so we're at this very interesting time where governance all around the world are realizing that what they're doing isn't working and that we need alternatives. And th it's a great time to be presenting those alternatives in those spaces. Josie. Hello. Hello. Hey there. Uh, I'm curious. Sorry, I've got a bunch of echo. One second. Okay. Anyways, I'll carry on. Um, so I'm 100% in. I'm so excited about your program. Um, but 2025 is going to be the better time for me. So in the meantime, I was wondering if you could recommend um, a way to start preparing other than the essentials, like a reading list or volunteer opportunities or any kind of way to get hands on and get into it while I'm preparing for 2025. Yeah, absolutely. So we have three different uh, primers that we released that I think are a really good place to start. There's a professional one, a steward one, and an advocate one. Uh, and it's really, these are each pathways through, you know, at this point, we have so much content, it's a little bit hard to navigate. And so these provide really clear through lines based on which angle you're coming at this work from and provide, I think, some really important learning and places to get started as well. Um, so definitely checking out the community, checking out the stories uh, on our website, the films. If you, know, if you haven't watched any of that stuff, our webinars, we have so many great people that we've had on our webinars. There's so much information in those. Uh, and then I'm also going to put in the chat here um, each of those different primers that are just a really nice place to get started um, they're not super long but you know there's a good bit of content to them and uh, if you watch each of those or whichever uh, corresponds to the the pathway that best describes you i think that's a really good place to start and that's going to give you lots of stuff you could be working on over the next year uh, to go into the course with a little bit more experience. Awesome. Is, is there a, a course? That, I mean, it seems like the steward, advocate, and professional are kind of a holistic. I mean, to me, it sounds like all one big thing that I would want to do. So how do you know where to start? Or do you just, can you do them all three? Oh, oh basically the professional is all three. The steward is you know, not as much as the professional. And then the advocate is uh, even a little bit less than the steward and doesn't require land. So you you have access to all the same content and actions, um, irregardless of which pathway you choose. It's really just for certification, which actions do you have to do? So by the time you've worked your way through to professional, you've got the certifications for steward and ag advocate as well yes exactly oh awesome yeah and so really that it's more of a tiered certification where if you're a professional you have the steward and advocate certification we don't list it that way but the you know all the professionals have done everything that those other two groups have done and then more Okay, fantastic. I heard you talking on our future with Matt Powers, and I super loved your emphasis on just getting the hands-on experience and getting that confidence loop. So I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, yeah, definitely check out those um, primers that I sent in there because that's a, a really great place to start.
uh, and start getting your hands dirty. And then if you haven't already, make sure you join the community because there's all sorts of stuff happening there, uh, whether it's upcoming events that you can be learning from or other people working on projects in your area or just asking questions like, you know, hey, I'm working on this rain garden. What do you guys think? Okay. Yeah, great. I'd love to find a place to roll up my sleeves and get dirty. So that sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Looking forward to it, Josie. Thank you. Uh, a question I see here from Zealig uh, is... Um, one is I live on a mountain, uh, already very skilled, um, but how would I connect with people wanting this type of work? Uh, and then I'd really like to travel around the world to different areas to work on different projects. Is that possible? Um, so definitely that's possible. That's really exactly what I do. And how do you connect with people? I mean, one, the community itself is a great way to connect with people. But two, these actions that we get you to do as part of that advocacy, that's going to naturally draw out the people interested in this kind of thing in your region. And so whether that's people to work with, co-conspire with, or clients, um, a lot of our students find that in that first presentation or those first couple of events, that's where they get their first projects. Uh, so it's a little bit scary and awkward to put yourself out there, but it's a really essential piece to starting to build those connections. I wonder, Nick, do you wanna to speak to that too a bit as you're now you know, traveling around all over the place working on these kind of projects, how are people finding you? Um, yeah, it's actually a bit of a, mix i find the most important thing is people just need to know that you're out there and that you're doing this kind of work so as soon as people know that you can do this they they reach out so i have not done any kind of in the marketing what would be called outbound marketing so i've never approached anyone and say like hey do you want me to work for you like everyone is finding me somehow so i would highly recommend when you get started just sharing it somewhere you know if you have social media that can be a great place if not just talking about it with your friends for some jobs i got from people who said like hey i talked to this friend and they said you're doing this water work could you come to my place and help me design it so that's how i'm getting some jobs other c projects so also as part of the course when i was first building the first few features i just posted them and shared pictures of them and then people were like hey i also want that um can you help me with that and so now projects are coming in from from all over. So Oliver and I just had a call uh, with a project in New Zealand that we might work with. Uh, and so, yeah, it's it's they're they're really coming in. When people know that you can do the work, jobs are gonna come. Like drought, flood, fire, those things are happening everywhere. They're getting more and more extreme. And yeah, I can't think of any job that's more more future proof, unfortunately. It's one of the things I end up talking about with all of my colleagues is it's a really great time to be working in water. And it's unfortunate in a way that it's such a great time to be working in water, but it is such a dire need every year more and every year in more places. Uh, and so it, until we have some really big societal changes, this is very much a future-proof career that we're just going to need more and more of as we get into the next couple of decades. I see a question here from Brett. Um, would love to explore hosting a workshop at our site in Northern New Mexico. Um, how do I engage? That sounds great. Um, we would love to do some more stuff in the Southwest. You can reach out to us uh, on the contact page of our website. And then Megan can uh, send you a form that we have for people who want to host workshops. Uh, and then as we're arranging our future trips, we have in mind, uh, you know, what you'd like to do, what facilities you have available and where you're located. Uh, so, yeah, would love to hear from you, Brett, and anyone else. Uh, you can also just email us directly at workshop at waterstories.com. Uh, and then Megan can send you that workshop questionnaire for people who want to host. Uh, 
Awesome. I think we're uh, getting there. Um, yeah, the I think we we really touched on the getting approvals from the government. Um, but there's there's this question: Is that getting easier or is it getting worse? Um, I think it's getting easier. I would say it's definitely not getting worse, but it is also really bad to start out with. So. Um, but it, it is definitely getting easier and easier. And one of the big things that we see is if you make a small example in your area, then it's really easy for regulators to approve it. And so we've had a number of different students now build small beaver dam analogs along waterways that they wouldn't have been allowed to build, but then they brought out the natural resource manager and they said, yes, that's great. You can keep doing that. Just keep doing more like that because they saw the results. So they would have never approved it up front, but they did a really small example like a kid would do. So they weren't going to get in big trouble for it. And then with that regulator being able to see it, they now understand it and no longer fear it. Um, so I, I think it's definitely getting a lot easier. We have a long way to go there still. Um, and this is one of the things where I take a lot of hope from seeing what the students do through the course in that, you know, now there's a whole nonprofit that's been started by some students to make this kind of work easier in the state of Oregon. Uh, and so, you know, it can pretty quickly change when we have people creating on the ground examples and advocating for it in their local municipality. You can be surprised how quickly those levers can change because, at the same time as there's some some challenges and conflict right now, there's also a huge wave of interest and support for this type of work. Uh, and so a lot of times it's just finding the alignment and scaling things appropriately and not doing too much at one time. Awesome. Um, uh, Anthony, really sorry to hear about your, your situation here. Um, but I'd say, you know, the same uh, that applies as far as uh, the person who is looking to do the course next year. Those primers are a great place to start. Uh, the community is a great place to start. The webinars are a great place to start. So, you know, while we have this course, it's a very in-depth, intensive experience. We also offer a ton that's just available all the time for free. Uh, and so I think the first thing to do is just make use of all those resources, attend those webinars. The webinar we had yesterday was mind-blowing. Um, and we have that kind of stuff all the time. So I think, you know, just just keep in the loop and keep showing up and you're going to learn a lot of these things through osmosis, uh, whether you want to or not. Awesome. Uh... Good question here. Uh, is there documents precedents that can be used to share with regulators the benefit of this work if they have resistance? Um, there is some documentation uh, that was shared at the recent UN Water Conference by McCall Krawchuk. That's in the science section of the community. Um, I think that's a really good three-page primer for regulators. So that's a good place to point them towards. Um, there is, you know, there's lots of case studies and examples all over the community. You could find one that is particularly applicable to your context and then use that as an example as well. A lot of times short videos can be powerful. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's, it's one of the things that we're continuing to work on and develop. And as we have more success stories, we're sharing more as far as the different pathways. We do want to eventually have a, a task force of students um, that's, you know, really just focused on that. Uh, and so it, it's definitely in our purview and something that there's some support on, but I'd say there's also a lot of room for growth there.
Awesome. Um, well, I think that's a good point to wrap it up for today. Um, yeah, been really great to connect with you guys. I uh, really appreciate all the good questions, all the interest. I'm going to put the link to the course here in the chat one more time. Oh, that's the wrong link. Um, and it's only available till the 31st. So if you've been wanting to focus on water, if you've been wanting to learn how to do this kind of work with your own hands, uh, if it's a goal for this year, don't wait too long because the, the end is near, the end is coming.